Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, I'll be discussing section 6.2, Set Properties. We will be investigating statements about sets in, in two ways initially, visualizing them using Venn diagrams and then proving them using what are called element arguments. We discussed this in the previous video. Later, we'll be talking about proving statements about sets using theorems and previously proved results. We'll be using some uh, earlier results, some very old things from chapter two, this theorem about logical equivalences, also from chapter two, this table of valid argument forms, and then more recent things from chapter six, the definition of subset, A is a subset of B means for all X in A, X is in B. The definition of set equality, to say that sets A and B are equal means that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. And then these definitions of operations on sets from chapter six, section 6.1. The definition of a union of sets, intersection of sets, the complement of a set, and the difference of sets. So our first example, we'll be uh, investigating a statement about sets in two ways. Uh, this is, uh, got a, I've got a typo here, consider the following statement about sets. The statement says, for all sets A, B, C, if A is a subset of B, then A intersect C is a subset of B intersect C. And this is a universal statement. So question A is to use Venn diagrams to illustrate the statement. Now, this statement is part of, is the subject of, of exercise 6.2, number 16 in the book. And in that question in the book, they don't say to use a Venn diagram to illustrate the statement, but I think it's a good idea to always, when you have a statement about sets, uh, to, to be able to visualize it for yourself and for explaining it to someone else. So how will we use Venn diagrams to illustrate that? So first of all, we should have an illustration of the hypothesis. So there's the hypothesis illustrated. And then we have to have an illustration of the conclusion. Now how do we, how do we illustrate that? Well, I'm going to illustrate that using two drawings. I'm going to make both those drawings by starting with a copy of the drawing that we've already got. So there's the drawing that we've already got. I'm going to add uh, a set C to this drawing. And then I'm going to make a second copy of that drawing. So in this middle drawing, I'm going to illustrate A intersect C. And in the rightmost drawing, I'm going to illustrate B intersect C. So there's a way of illustrating this statement using Venn diagrams. This is not any kind of proof. It's just a way of uh, making sense of it visually. Let's do a proof. Prove the statement using an element argument. This is the subject of that exercise. So the, the the statement we're trying to prove is for all A, B, C. For all A, B, C, if A is a subset of B, then A intersect C is a subset of B intersect C. So notice this is a universal conditional statement. So we'll prove this using the method of direct proof. So there's the, the standard way of starting a direct proof. We introduce sets that are in the domain and that satisfy the hypothesis. Now how does this proof have to end? The conclusion of the conditional statement is this. So we have no choice but to end the proof with that statement.
Now, that's the frame of the direct proof. What else do we have to do? Well, notice that the first statement includes a defined expression. A, inter a is a subset of B. So we have no choice but to follow this up with um, uh, a statement that, that says what that really means. Furthermore, looking to the end of the proof, we have an expression that's a defined, it contains a defined term, subset. So we have to precede this with a statement that says what that really means. Notice that I had to use a different letter. I had to use the letter Y because the letter X was already taken. Now, looking ahead at this final statement that we have to get to, how do we get to there? Well, we have to introduce a generic Y that's in A intersect C and show that it is also in B intersect C. So that's going to happen way back at the beginning. So that's the frame of what we have to do in order to prove this. For all y in A intersect C, y is also in B intersect C. So we have to start by introducing a y that's in A intersection C. So that's a generic particular element. And our goal is to prove that y is in B intersection C. Oh, but look, there's some inevitable stuff here. We have a defined expression. y is in the intersection of A and C. So we have to state what that really means. And looking ahead, we have a defined expression here. So we have no choice but to precede this with what that really means. So before being able to say this, we have to have previously said this. And once we do that, the justification for this step will be the following. So look, we now have a gap to bridge. We have to get from statement 4 to this unnumbered statement. And look how close they are. They only differ here. We've already got the statement that y is an element of c appearing in both of those statements. But we need to somehow get from this statement that says y is an element of a to this statement that says y is an element of b. Well, I'm going to use one of our old um, arg uh, valid argument forms. This one, specialization. If you know that p is true and q is true, then you can say that p is true. Also, if you know that P is true and Q is true, you can say that Q is true. So using that valid argument form, I can follow statement 4 with this statement. So both of those statements, 5 and 6, come from statement 4, just using this valid argument form called specialization. So look, a statement uh, 5 can be used in conjunction with statement 2 to tell us the following. Statement 5 says that y is an element of a. Statement 2 says that for all elements of a, the element is also in b. So that lets us say that therefore y is an element of b. Now look, uh, we need to get to here, there's a typo there, we've got these two statements, y is an element of C, y is an element of B. And we want to say this, this and statement, well, that's one of our valid argument forms again. P is true, Q is true, therefore, P and Q is true. So that's called conjunction.
So we take the conjunction of those two previously known statements. So you see that um, this previously unnumbered statement is going to be statement 8. And then this statement is going to be statement 9. And then statement 10 is from what we did here, from 3 and 9. And then this last statement is statement 11. And there's our proof. Now, I didn't do a very good job of color coding this, but maybe I'll talk about the structure and what was inevitable and what we added uh, just as final summary. We have a direct proof, so we had no choice about this frame. It had to begin with um, the, the generic particular element that is in the domain and satisfies the hypothesis. And we had to end with a statement that was the conclusion. And then we had a bunch of other stuff that was inevitable. We had all of this stuff that was inevitable and all of this stuff that was inevitable. So the only gap that we had to bridge, the only stuff that we had to come up with ourselves, was this stuff in the middle. OK, let's go on. Example two. This is similar to one of your homework problems. It's, this one is uh, exercise 6.2 number 9 in the book. It's similar to your 6.2 number 13. In this example, we're considering this set identity. A set identity is an equation involving expressions of uh, that involve sets and it has the property that for all sets that you substitute in for these letters the equation is true so question a is not part of the homework exercise but uh, it's useful draw venn diagrams to illustrate the set identity well i'm going to draw a bunch of venn diagrams i'm going to start by drawing one and copying it uh, multiple times Okay, so there are my generic sets A, B, and C. Now, um, I want to illustrate various quantities here. In the first diagram, I'm going to illustrate A minus B. In the second diagram, I'm going to illustrate C minus B. And in this third diagram at the bottom, I'm going to illustrate the union of those two sets. Over here on the right, this diagram I'm going to illustrate A union C. This diagram I'm going to illustrate B. And finally, I'm going to illustrate the difference of those two. So A minus B is this set. C minus B is this set. The union of those two sets is this set. Going over to the right side, A union C is this set. And the set B is this set. And the difference of those two sets is this set. So the statement that we're illustrating is this. And you can see that those two shaded pictures are the same. And again, this is not a proof. It's just an illustration that helps us make sense of the statement. Question B is to prove the statement using an element argument. So here we go. Now, how do we prove such a thing? Well, remember the, the generic uh, argument that we have to make. This is a universal statement, and we have to prove by generalizing from a generic particular element. So we have no choice but to start this proof with introduction of the generic particular elements. And then we have to end this proof by stating that. That's got to be the end. So that is the inevitable frame of this proof. Now, how do we do that? Well, the key is to notice that this final statement includes a defined expression. To say that two sets are equal means something. So we have no choice but to have previously uh, proved what it really means that those two sets are equal. 
So what does it mean? Remember what it means to say that two sets are equal. It means that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So in order to prove that those two sets are equal, we're going to have to do that, and we're going to have to do that. So we'll do that in two parts. Proof part one will prove that the left side equals the right side. So how do we do that? Well, that's a defined expression. We have no choice but to do that this way. So in proof part one, our goal is to prove this statement. So that's going to be the, re the end of proof part one. Now how will we do that? The only way to prove this subset uh, expression is true is to say this. Suppose x is in the left side, show that therefore x is in the right side. OK, now see if we can bridge this gap. We have to get from here to here. In this step, we did what we had to do. We had to deal with that defined expression. But now we have another defined expression. We have these intersections. So we have to deal with that. So in that statement, we dealt with this defined expression. We wrote what it really means on the next line. So, so far, everything that we've done has been inevitable. Now look, we have this and this, or this and this. But notice that this is the same as that. Let's go back and look at our earlier um, properties from chapter 2. Look at that one. P and Q or R is logically equivalent to P and Q or P and R. So that's the distributive law from theorem 2.1.1. Well, we can use that to rewrite this. The distributive law lets us replace this expression with this expression, or vice versa. Oh, but now we have something which we can replace uh, with uh, a union symbol. Now here we need a little bit more space, so I'm going to uh, move some stuff down to the next page. So I'm going to grab all this stuff and move it down. So we have arrived at this statement. X is in A union C and X is in B complement. Let's uh, and look where we need to go. We need to get to here. So let's, uh, let's rewrite statement 7 using the intersection symbol. And then, look, this statement that we are trying to get to here is actually the next statement. So let's move this back up and put it right after statement 8. So we're going to move all this stuff up to right after statement 8. So 
part, proof part one was inevitable. We had to prove that the left side is a subset of the right side. And we had no choice about how to do that. We'd have to, we had to start by saying, suppose X is in the left side, and we had to end by saying that therefore X is in the right side, and that's how we s prove that the left side is a subset of the right side. And everything that we did was inevitable. To say that X is in the left side means this OR statement because of the definition of union. And to say that uh, X is in this difference means this. We use the definition of difference. We had no choice about that. To say that X is in the intersection means this AND statement. We have no choice about that. That's the definition of intersection. Uh, and then the, the clever thing was this statement. Going from here, statement 5, to here, recognizing that we had this old law called the distributive law that would let us do that. And then everything else was inevitable. Here we're packing up the definition of union. We took this OR statement and we packed it up into a, a, a statement involving the union symbol. And then we packed up the definition of, of uh, um, this should say intersection. We packed up the definition of intersection. We we replaced this AND statement with this intersection symbol. And previously we had done the similar, uh, the same thing, packing up this definition of union. We took this OR statement and we replaced it with a statement involving union. So all of these statements were just unpacking definitions or packing them back up, except for this one clever statement here where we had to use the distributive law. That's the end of proof part one. Now proof part two, we have to prove that the right side of this expression is a subset of the left side. Well here I think I'm going to not do the details because you can see how this is going to work. It's going to be the same sort of idea. Oops. So. So proof part two will unfold much like proof part one. And then let's zoom out. In proof part one, we showed that the left side is a subset of the right side. In proof part two, we would show that the right side is a subset of the left side. And so that allows us to say, therefore, the two sets are equal. That's the end of that proof. OK, example three. Um, this is exercise 6.2, number 18. Consider this statement about sets. For all sets A and B, if A is a subset of B, then B complement is a subset of A complement. So let's uh, illustrate this using Venn diagrams. That's not part of the question in the book, but it's, it's good to always think about diagrams to illustrate a statement. Now, one thing that's important to think about is the idea of the universal set. Notice that there's no mention in here explicitly about the universal set. But we are talking about complements. So you, you have to think about the universal set to think about the complement of a set. So I'm going to make illustrations that include a universal set. So there's my drawing of a set A that's a subset of set B. And they're, they're all uh, subsets of a universal set. Now I'm going to make a couple of copies of this. All right, now how do I illustrate this? And uh, well, first of all, let me, let me put down below these the statements that I'm trying to illustrate. So this first diagram illustrates the fact that A is a subset of B. Now, the second diagram needs to show B complement. The third diagram needs to show A complement.
And there you can see that uh, B complement is clearly a subset of A complement. Okay, let's go on. Question B is to prove the statement using an element argument. Now, the reason I'm doing this example is because in this proof, if we recognize the contrapositive, the proof will be very simple. So how will we prove this? We have to prove this universal conditional statement. So we have to do the method of direct proof. That means we start with sets that are from the domain and that satisfy the hypothesis. And we know how this proof has to end. It has to end with the statement of the conclusion. Now, um, what else is inevitable? There's the frame of our direct proof. What else is inevitable? Well, we have a defined expression. So we have to write in statement two what that really means. Now let's see what else is inevitable. Notice the, the final statement of the proof also includes a defined expression. So we have no choice but to precede that with uh, what that really means. And if we have that statement there, then the justification for the last statement of the proof will be. Now, there's um, something else that we need to deal with. This statement that we just wrote has defined expressions in it, the complement. So we have to proceed this with what those really mean. Okay, so here's our gap that we need to bridge. Everything that we've written so far is, is inevitable. The frame and then the unpacking and, and the packing up of those defined expressions. But wait, look, this is just the contrapositive of that. So there's nothing to do here. The justification for the black statement is the, the by statement two. It's just the contrapositive. So statement, um, the black statement, which is going to be statement three, is true because it's the contrapositive of statement two. And then the red statement becomes our statement four, justified by statement three. And the blue statement becomes our statement five, justified by our statement four. So in this proof, once we did all the stuff that was inevitable, we realized there was nothing to do but just simply recognize that a statement was the contrapositive of a statement that had just been made. So that's uh, a good illustration of the value of being on the lookout for a contrapositive. Anytime you have a conditional statement kicking around, realize in the back of your mind that the contrapositive of that statement is equivalent to that. That's the end of that example. Uh, example four, this is 6.2 number 36. Prove that for all sets ABC, if C is a subset of B minus A, then A intersect C is empty. Well, let's draw a Venn diagram to illustrate this statement. So we need to draw a Venn diagram of generic sets ABC that satisfy this. I'm not sure how uh, convincing this drawing is. Maybe uh, a better way of drawing this would be the following. Let's move this stuff down. 
and move this up, copy it, So there is a picture of A intersect C, and notice that nothing is shaded in that diagram. So A intersect C is the empty set. It's shown by having nothing shaded in this diagram. So this example, the, the Venn diagrams, are, are a little bit um, less convincing to draw, but, but it's worth drawing them just to, to visualize the statements being made. Okay, let's go on. Uh, question B, which is similar to one of your homework problems, is to prove the statement using an element argument. So our statement is, if C is a subset of B minus A, then A intercept C is the empty set. Let's call that statement S. Now we're going to prove statement S by uh, the method of, of uh, contradiction. So let's form the negation of statement S. So the negation of this if-then statement is this and statement. The negation of, of if P then Q is P and not Q. So we're going to prove statement S using the method of, of uh, contradiction. So that means that we'll assume that S is false. We're going to assume that the negation of S is true. So remember how the proof by contradiction goes. We start by assuming S is false. So if we assume that S is false, then we're assuming that the negation of S is true. So we're assuming this, that there exist sets A, B, and C such that C is a subset of B minus A, and A intercept C is not 0. Well, since A minus C is not the empty set, then there exists an element X that's in the intersection of A and C. So then, um, since X is in A intersect C, we can say the following. X is in A and X is in C. That's just the definition of intersection. Now we can separate that using the specialization both of those are by 3 and specialization. But look, x is in C, and C is a subset of B minus A. But that means that x is in B intersection A complement. And that, in turn, means an AND statement. And that, in turn, means the following. We use specialization to say that since these are both true, I can say that the second one is true. But that means that x is not an element of A. Now look, we have statement 10, which contradicts statement 4. We've reached a contradiction. Now remember what I've said about contradiction proofs. You need to make it very clear what contradicts what. And also you need to, to make it very clear what you're supposed to do with that information. Well, since we've reached a contradiction, our assumption was, was, was wrong. Our assumption was way back at the beginning. Our assumption was that S is false. So S cannot be false. Therefore, S is true. And that's the end of the proof. So you have an example like this, an exercise like this in your homework, where you prove that a set is empty
by doing a proof by contradiction. You, you assume that it's not empty and you show that that reaches a contradiction. Okay, let's go on. Now, uh, the element argument that we used uh, in example two to prove this set identity is the same sort of argument that could be used to prove two theorems that are presented in section 6.2. Um, theorems about subset relations and, uh, and theorems about set identities. There are a whole bunch of set identities. All of those set identities would be proved the same way that we proved our, our example two. And in fact, our earlier example, we proved a subset uh, statement that was uh, proved using an element argument. Well, the idea of stating and proving these theorems is that they give us tools that can be used to prove other subset relations and other set identities. And in particular, those theorems would give us a different way of proving the set identity that we proved in example two. And, um, and the, the result that we proved in example four. So we'll revisit those examples and do that kind of proof now. So example two, we proved this set identity using an element argument. But this time we're going to use um, known set identities from theorem 6.2.2. So we have to prove that this set is equal to that set. So how do we do that? Well, let's just start by writing down the left side of this equation. Now, what do we do here? We start by um, dealing with this minus sign. We replace these symbols with what they really mean. Now, what fact did we use there? Let's go back up and look. We used set difference law. So we used theorem 6.2.2 part 12. Now, what's next? Notice that in this expression on the right, both of these terms have a B, a B complement. So let's go up and look at our our properties, our, our uh, known set identities. This distributive law applies. In this distributive law, on the right-hand side, there are two expressions that both contain the same term in an intersection. So distributive law 3b. Now, um, what can we do with that? Well, we want to get to this. Look how close we are. We just use that same theorem 6.2.2.12 to replace this with this. So that is a much shorter proof of that set identity. We've proved that this set is the same as this set using set identities from theorem 6.2.2. Now, for our final example, I want to revisit example four. We proved this statement about sets using an element argument. This time I want to use theorems uh, and previously proved results. So how do we prove this? Well, notice that this is a universal conditional statement. So again, we're going to have a direct proof. So that much will be the same. So we have to start with that introduction of a generic particular element. So and sets A, B, C that are in the domain and that satisfy the hypothesis. And then how do we have to end? Well, we have a universal conditional. So we have to end with uh, that, that A intersect C is the empty set. Now, I find it 
clear is to just simply do a string of inclusions and equal signs. They may, that may sound vague, so let me just uh, um, start and you'll see how this goes. So first off, I want to state this inclusion, that A intersect C is a subset of A intersect B minus A. Now where does that come from? Well, it comes from two places. It comes from the fact that we know that C is a subset of B minus A, so it sort of makes sense that this left thing would be a subset of this right thing, because C is a subset of B minus A. It makes sense, but where does that come from uh, officially? Well, let's go back and look at our example one. In example one, we proved that if A is a subset of B, then A intersect C is a subset of B intersect C. So that's a previously proved result. So we can use that in our later proof. So we use the result of example one and our given fact that C is a subset of B minus A. Now we can have an equation, an equal sign. Now this is from that recent theorem, the set difference law, so theorem 6.2.2.12. And then we can do more. That's the commutativity property, the fact that this equals this is the commutative law, which is part of theorem 6.2.2. Now we can move those parentheses using the associative law, associative law 2a, and then we use the fact that a complement intersect a is the empty set. And that comes from this, theorem 6.2.25b. And finally, the empty set intersection B is the empty set. Now, why is that? It's because of this. Any set intersect the inter empty set is the empty set. So that's theorem 6.2.2. 8b. So we have so far shown that A intersection C is a subset of the empty set. Now our goal is to prove that it actually equals the empty set. So for this we're going to need a little bit more space. We'll go down to the next page. So I'm going to move this stuff down to the next page. So, so far we've shown that A intersect C is a subset of the empty set. Now, in a previous example from the previous video, we showed that the empty set is a subset of every set. So, if we number our statements, the first statement was 1, then we have this long string of, uh, of subsets and equal signs. So that's statement two. And then statement three is this, that the empty set is a subset of A intersect C. So therefore, from statements two and statement three, we can get this, that's, that A intersect C is the empty set. So this is statement four and it could be moved up. So you see that we've now done two examples. Example two, we revisited and proved using uh, previously proved theorems and facts. All the, all the things we used came from theorem 6.2.2. And then we revisited example four, and we proved example four's result 
using instead of an el an element argument, we used uh, previously proved facts. And those previous facts came from uh, from the theorem 6.2.2. It came from this example one that we proved earlier in this video and came from this uh, fact from the previous video that the empty set is a subset of every set. So there are two examples of using previously proved facts or theorems to prove new facts about sets. Okay, that's the end of the video. Thank you.